Good morning, good, good day, good afternoon, good evening, good night to everybody uh, online. Thank you for joining uh, the ATBC Neotropical Chapter event. Uh, I'm delighted to open this session, which is bridging the gap between scientists and restoration practitioners uh, to promote natural regeneration uh, of forests. Um, my name is Rakan Zahawi. I'm the chair of the Neotropical Chapter. Um, and I'm the executive director of the Charles Darwin Foundation in the Galapagos, and that's where I am right now. So hopefully the internet will hold up for this, this session. Um, but we have many backups, so we'll be fine. Um, perhaps uh, before I go through the uh, outline of, of today's uh, event, the rest of the Neotropical Chapter uh, team can, can present themselves. Thank you, Zach. Uh, uh, I'm Juan Posada, co-chair of the Neotropical Chapter and professor at the University of El Rosario. Thank you, Zach. I'm Natalia Norden. I'm a, a staff researcher at the Instituto Alexander von Humboldt in Colombia, and I'm also part of the Neotropical Chapter. Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Patricia Sampaio. I am the TCG, Tropical Conservation Development Program at the University of Florida Program Coordinator and ATBC Treasurer and ATBC uh, Chapter, no, Tropical Chapter Treasurer, welcome. Zach, you, you, you're muted. Okay, try again. Um, so as I mentioned already, uh, today's theme is bridging the gap between scientists and restoration practitioners to promote natural restoration of forests. Um, we have a, uh, a lot of things planned for this morning or afternoon or evening. Um, we're gonna start the program uh, with an opening talk by Dr. Pedro Brancaleon from the Universidad de Sao Paulo. Um, and Natalia will uh, uh, present um, uh, Pedro for us. Um, yeah. And he's going to speak about the challenges and opportunities to promote natural regeneration of forests. So Pedro is an associate professor at the Department of Forest Science at the University of Sao Paulo. Uh, he's a vice, vice co coordinator of the Atlantic Forest Restoration Pact and affiliated member of the Brazilian Academy of Sciences. He has published over 170 peer reviewed papers uh, and he coordinates large research and technology projects financed by research ad agencies, NGOs and private companies. Overall, he's a he, he, he wants to be called as a, as a generalist focused on developing cost effective solutions to conserve and restore tropical forests based on interdisciplinary research and co-production of knowledge with multiple uh, stakeholders. Thanks, Natalia. Um, uh, immediately after that uh, opening talk, we will have our, our panel session. Um, I will just name the panelists for now because our moderator, uh, Robin Chasden, will present them after the talk. But they are uh, Dr. Renato Cruzeas, uh, Dr. Juan Manuel Dupuy, Dr. Uh, David Guterlunge, and Dr. Danieli. Uh, Celentano. Um, and our moderator for that session and for many other parts of the uh, session today is Dr. Robin Chasden from the University of Connecticut and Natalia will also present her 
uh, as well. Yeah, Robin is a professor emerita at the University of Connecticut and a research professor with the Tropical Forest and People Research Center of the University of Sunshine Coast in Queensland, Australia. She is the lead consultant with Forestation International and a senior fellow with W. w uh, RI's Global Restoration Initiative and a senior research associate with the International Institute of Sustainability in Rio de Janeiro uh, in Brazil um, and in the New Australia branch. Her research focuses on spatial planning for large scale restoration and leveraging the potential for natural regeneration. She's an active member of the FAO Task Force on Best Practices for the UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration and a member of the First Organization Organ Advisory Committee. Thanks, Natalia. So the panel session will last approximately one hour. We have a few specific questions uh, for each of the panelists and a couple of collective questions. Uh, participants will then be able to ask uh, a few questions um, but once the hour is up, we will take a short break, a 10 minute break. Um, we'll come back uh, to the event uh, at around, um, well, these are all uh, Colombia times, but uh, uh, after the 10 minute break, around the half hour for a slideshow presentation by Mariana Oliveira. Um, again, her presentation, we will introduce her formally um, just before the slideshow and after the break, because otherwise it will be too many introductions in a row. Um, thereafter, we'll have our breakout rooms, and this is this is our our hope here is to to really get participants engaged in in some of these uh, bigger questions. Um, we do have um, four breakout rooms. We'll be organizing that behind the scenes. Uh, each breakout room will have one of the panelists present and uh, a neotropical chapter member as well. Uh, our two main moderators, Pedro uh, and, and Robin will be going uh, in and out of these different rooms during this session. Um, this will be about uh, 40 uh, minutes or so. Room one is how can we improve communication and knowledge sharing between academia and restoration practitioners? Room two, how can we use long-term data and seedling and tree dynamics to better inform restoration practices and its expectations? Room three, what tools and technologies can help promote effective restoration planning, implementation, and monitoring? And room four, what social and economic factors favor natural regeneration as a restoration approach? Um, you will be able to choose which room you want to go to. So, so start thinking about that. Um, and obviously we will post these uh, sort of themes again when it comes time to, to pick your breakout session. Uh, we'll also be looking for uh, one volunteer from each uh, of those groups from the uh, participants to take notes and uh, summarize uh, the discussion back in the, what we call the plenary session um, when we all reconvene again, um, which will last about 30 minutes or so. Um, there may be some uh, time there for Q&A. Uh, that session will also be presided by uh, Robin and Pedro. And then both Robin and Pedro will, will synthesize this wonderfully at the end um, and provide a few closing remarks. Um, so with that, I'd like to hand over the microphone to uh, Pedro. Thank you, Zach. Can you, can you hear me and, and see me well? Okay, all good. So thank you for, for the invitation and, and thank you for the introduction. It's a pleasure for me to kind of initiate the, this important meeting and kind of stimulate the group to think about some of the most hot topics in promoting natural regeneration of tropical forests. So I'll start presenting. And oh, here is, can you see my slides? 
Yes, Pedro. Okay, good. So in this presentation, I will try to cover some of the, which is, which is for me, some of the most, you know, critical issues to be addressed for unlocking the potential of natural generation of forests. So I see that there are many opportunities, but also some important challenges for, you know, kickstarting the use of natural regeneration in many different socio-ecological contexts. As you know, the demand for tropical restoration has never been so high. We have many national, subnational commitments, many private companies and governments. Everybody wants to restore forests at large scale and tropical forests in particular. And in the neotropics, they have been considered as hotspots for tropical reforestation agenda. And at the same time, we all know that it will be quite challenging for restoring so many million hectares in the coming years. And we have many challenges and, and you know, many barriers for, for advancing re restoration at such unprecedented scale. And natural regeneration has been indicated as the main, the main way, the main path to achieve large scale restoration. And many, many recent works have demonstrated that when large areas, they are abandoned across the new tropics, we may have large scale regeneration of tropical forests. So some of these previous studies, they have quantified the, the level of forest regeneration and associated it to forest transition theory and try to understand in which conditions we may have more favorable conditions for natural regeneration of forests. But at the same time that we know we rely on our natural regeneration to achieve large scale restoration commitments, we know very little about how to promote natural regeneration in restoration contexts. What we know is that if we abandon land at large scale, many of these lands will become natural forces again through natural regeneration processes. But when we are engaged in a restoration program and we have to restore a specific portion of land, our capacity to predict if that land will become a native forest in a given period of time without any human support except for the protection of area is quite low. We don't know. There is a lot of uncertainty associated to it and a lot of risk. So we don't know if these areas will become a forest again. How long does it, does it, take, does it may take? And how will the forest regenerate in terms of biodiversity and potential provision of ecosystem services? So here I will list some of the, maybe the, the key research and practice topics to be addressed for unlocking the potential of natural regeneration for upscaling tropical forest restoration. So the first one, I have a total of six. I could list many more, but I, I selected here the main six in my view. So the first one is that we have to improve the models that have been used for predicting natural generation potential. We have an important bias when designing these models because we use the areas that regenerated in the, in the past few years and try to predict the areas that may regenerate in the future based on the extrapolation of the socio-ecological conditions in which these areas, these previous areas regenerated. But we have an important challenge here, that is we, we do not have any information about the areas that could have regenerated, but did not regenerate it because of you know, any human interference. So all of the models we have, they are some way biased and we need to develop alternative ways to better under, understand the potential of natural regeneration and some way to disentangle it from the human inter interferences in this process. And to understand also in which human contexts natural regeneration has a better chance 
to, to proceed. At the same time that we have many predictive models, very few of them has been really validated. So we need a follow-up effort to validate these models and, and to critically understand to which extent they are applied or not, which, which are the main gaps, which are the main you know, challenges for applying these models to practice. I think another potential avenue for development is the use of novel remote sensing approaches. So one of the challenges for studying natural generation is that it may take many years to proceed. And we always use a kind of historical perspective to understand natural generation. And we rely on, on satellite data about, the, about forest cover. But when we bring you know, natural generation science to practice, we, do, we need a much more agile approach. We need to know if we have to invest money on a given area or not. We cannot wait for 30 years to decide what to do. And then I see a, an important role for novel remote sensing approaches because they can give us a kind of real time feedback about natural generation. By using drones, we can fly over regenerating areas every year, and then we can much better follow the natural generation trajectory and define interventions when necessary. At the same time, we are, you know, everybody says that natural generation is imperative for achieving large scale restoration commitments because they allow to reduce the costs of restoration process. We have few studies demonstrating and quantifying the potential of cost savings resulted from natural regeneration. So we need to better integrate economics with natural regeneration science and quantify the benefits because it's different to simply say natural regeneration can reduce your costs and then saying that natural regeneration can reduce your costs by a hundred million dollars. So that's the kind of information we need and we need this information specialized so people, decision makers, they can improve the way they promote natural regeneration, considering the specific socio-ecological conditions of each, each polygon, each target area. Then I think we need to find ways to maximize natural regeneration. It is clear that some areas will generate very very fast and very efficiently, but many others may not. And we, we, we need to find a, a way in between tree plantations and natural regeneration, unassisted natural regeneration. And then I see an important role for applied nucleation in order, other ways to intervene in the regeneration process in order to maximize the capacity of nature to restore a forest without any major human support or major interventions. So for instance, I have tested here the use of drones to spray selective herbicides, in natural regeneration areas in order to control invasive grasses while favoring the growth of native tree species. There, I'm also involved in using drones to do direct seeding of some species. So here in Atlantic Forest of Brazil, we are testing the use of drones for sowing the seeds of uh, endemic and threatened palm, Eutarp adelis, but in the context of reintroducing the species in overexploited areas. But we could eventually use this kind of technology to spread seeds over areas of natural regeneration. So we have to find ways to promote natural regeneration at scale without increasing the cost of the process. We also have to make regeneration pay. You, you know, pe many people live from these areas and they just recut uh, uh, regenerating forests because people must make a living on land use. So we have to find ways to, to provide revenues for, for people. Although traditional populations, indigenous communities, they, they use pretty well these areas and that's okay we need to find ways for farmers to, to profit from these areas and hopefully 
people make profit, make have higher profits from natural generation than with extensive cattle ranching, for instance, for instance, which is a dominant land use across the new tropics. And finally, we have to find ways to ensure the permanence, the persistence of natural forest regrowth areas, because many of these areas they have regenerated, but they don't persist for many years. They are recut for for reestablishing some kind of agropastoral land use in the area. So it is some way related to the previous questions I brought because people only recut the forest in many cases because they want to profit from that land. So we have to find ways to, to make restoration, regeneration pay. And there are potential ways, but they must be better developed in order to attract landowners and to make restoration more palatable to them. So thank you for your attention. Uh, I hope these topics may, may stimulate a fruitful debate and, and discussions in, across this section. So thank you. Well, thank you so much, Pedro, for that uh, very broad and with only six points, very comprehensive. Uh, list of uh, research topics and challenges that really are should be at the forefront of, of the agenda that we have, that many of us uh, have been working on. Um, welcome to all of the participants. We have, we have 94 people listening today. That's wonderful. I'm Robin Chasden. I uh, will be your moderator for the panel discussion that we're about to have. And now I would like to introduce the four panelists um, first, uh, and then each of them will be asked questions. They won't be doing presentations. So uh, first I would like to introduce um, Renato Cruzelis. Uh, he is the director and CEO of the International Institute for Sustainability, Australia branch, and also the associate and senior manager at the Insti International Institute for Sustainability, IIS Rio. And he is an assistant professor in uh, the postgraduate course in environmental sciences at Vega de Almeida University. And um, also uh, in the postgraduate program in ecology at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. And he collaborates as a collaborator lecturer with the professional master's program in sustainability science at the Pontifical Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, and our next panelist will be uh, David Duder, sorry if I don't, Duder Lungi, um, who is a Belgian uh, plant ecologist at the, um, sorry. I'm not sure how to, uh, say this institute, um, but it's a federal research center in central Mexico. Um, he, he, uh, his research focuses on restoration ecology in rainforest and temperate oak forest ecosystems, as well as deserts. And he, he um, focuses a lot on traditional ecological knowledge in biodiversity hotspots. He has a PhD from tropical ecology at Ecosur in South Mexico in Chiapas and is a former IPBES member and um, is very active in programming as well. Uh, then we have um, David, I'm sorry, Juan Dupuy. Juan Dupuy is a plant community ecologist um, with research experience uh, in tropical forest structure diversity, composition, and dynamics, um, and forest regeneration in human modified landscapes. And uh, he is at the Scientific Research Center of Yucatan um, in Mexico. He has a BS degree in biology from Los Andes University in Bogota, and um, a master's and PhD um, in ecology from the University of Connecticut. And finally, Daniele Celentano, is a forest engineer from Brazil with a master's in tropical forest management and conservation um, in Costa Rica and a PhD in biodiversity and biotechnology. She is currently the forest restoration senior manager at Conservation International and is the executive secretary of the Alliance for Restoration in the Amazon 
and associate professor in the agroecology graduate program at the State University of Maranhão. Uh, Daniele has lived and worked in the Amazon region for 20 years, and uh, she uh, has two children and lives on a small farm uh, where she has a beautiful and very diverse garden. So thank you to all our panelists, and um, I hope that you are uh, you should all be showing yourselves now um, so that we can see you while, while the questions are asked. Um, so I would like to start with a question um, for Juan Manuel de Puy. And the question is, you'll have about um, five minutes for addressing the question, and then I'll move on to a question for other panelists. So Juan, what do you see as the main advantages and challenges of studying long-term chronosequences for informing restoration practices? Thank you, Robin, and good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I'm going to share my screen now uh, to help guide my answer to this question. Okay, so um, I would like first to clarify what we mean by chrono sequence and long-term chrono sequence. So chrono sequence or space for time substitution consists is by far the most common way of studying succession and it consists of sampling stands within a landscape that uh, share a common history and conditions, but differ in uh, successional age or age since abandonment. Now, this um, provides information about uh, successional trends or patterns that are inferred from a one-time uh, snapshot uh, without actually having to follow the process of succession throughout uh, from beginning to end. Now, chronosequence resampling or long-term chronosequences consists of monitoring plots that have been established along a chronosequence. And this technique provides uh, the actual trajectories of each successional plot or each successional um, sampling place, which are illustrated here by different colors in this graph. Um, so each technique has some advantages and disadvantages. The main advantage of chrono sequence is that it is, a, it is a quick and practical way of studying succession, and that enables it to have a large sample size and to sample potentially a lot of, a lot of variation. So it can be more representative. It, pro, it can provide more representative data. The main disadvantage of uh, this technique is that it assumes that all different sampling plots have followed the same or approximately the same trajectory illustrated by this black line in the left side panel. And also it doesn't provide much information about the actual processes or mechanisms underlying those changes. In contrast, uh, those same disadvantages can be partly overcome by chrono sequence resampling because it shows real trajectories and it can reveal the processes and mechanisms behind those changes. For example, demographic processes such as recruitment, growth, and mortality. The main disadvantage of this technique, however, is that it requires far more resources and sustained human and economic resources. And this limits the sample size, the amount of variation, and therefore the representativeness of this technique. Now, uh, in terms of uh, guiding information practice, uh, the main advantages of long-term chrono sequences is that they can inform restoration practice if and when assisted regeneration is possible. Uh, in particular, they provide very useful information about the underlying demographic processes, like I said before, and if they are complemented with microenvironmental and functional trait data, they can also provide information on species and community responses 
to environmental change and effects on ecosystem processes and services. Now, a big disadvantage of this technique is, as I said, that they require considerable time and sustained financial and human resources. And this limits the sample size, the variation and the representativeness of this data. And this is even compounded by an implicit assumption of this technique, which is that sites differ only or mostly in stand age and not in other factors that are known to affect uh, vegetation structure, diversity, composition, and dynamics. Uh, this is particularly critical for this technique. And this also affects the sampling time in the face of climate and global change. We are currently seeing extreme conditions, uh, and those are not easily picked up by short term studies. You need longer term studies which require a lot of resources, of course. Now, another problem is that both techniques may be biased towards good conditions, those conditions that enable successional recovery, and that degraded conditions, conditions which are more typical of restoration practice, may be underrepresented, as pointed out by um, Pedro Brancaleon earlier. So there is an inherent bias, or there could be an inherent bias, especially in the most cost, uh, costly uh, technique, which is long-term pronounced sequence. Now, another problem is that resample stands often show independent or idiosyncratic successional trajectories, which make it very difficult to predict, as also Pedro was pointing out earlier. Another limitation is that these both techniques assume that successional that dynamics, vegetation dynamics, occurs in a successional type way, with either a common uh, or potentially different trajectories, but they generally do not consider other possible vegetation dynamics. So I'd like to illustrate this with these graphs in which we have environmental conditions on the x-axis and the ecosystem equilibrium state on the y-axis. The uh, blue line represents uh, those ecosystem equilibrium conditions, how they change as environmental conditions change. Now, this can happen in a smooth and gradual way, which is uh, what basically succession assumes, but that is not the only way it can happen. We can have also abrupt changes uh, after passing a critical threshold, and this leads to regime shifts where we have different distinct uh, um, equilibrium states rather than a gradually changing one. Now, in this case, if we look at the graph on the right, the pathway of degradation is exactly the same pathway of recovery which means that by simply improving or reversing the environmental conditions that have been degraded, we will likely achieve the restoration goal of recovering the previous uh, state. However, there can be more complicated situations in which you have collapses as shown in this graph here uh, in which you, you can have two or more alternative stable states, that is two different equilibria for the same set of environmental conditions. And something even more uh, complicated and critical for uh, restoration is that you can have what is known as hysteresis. That is a lag in the recovery of the system and a different pathway of recovery with sometimes even different tipping points that need to be crossed for the system to return to uh, the pre-disturbed condition. Now, failing to consider non-successional dynamics can lead to unanticipated results and to unsuccessful restoration practices. This is why it is important to consider this as a limitation of these techniques in general. So uh, to sum up, long-term chronosequence can provide info 
very important information on actual successional trajectories for each vegetation uh, sampling point and on the underlying, underlying ecological drivers. And this can guide restoration practice if and when the degraded system can recover through assisted regeneration. The main challenges are securing the financial and human resources needed to provide mid to long term data that is representative of the degraded ecosystem state and conditions, and that allows prediction, as Pedro was saying, for future global change that is already happening. Plus, there is the challenge of correctly identifying the state and the conditions of the state of the uh, site that needs to be uh, restored, as well as the likely pathway of degradation and the potential future vegetation dynamics, including not just successional dynamics, but regime shifts with thresholds and collapses with alternative stable states and hysteresis. And with that, I conclude my intervention. Thanks very much, Robin. Thank you. Thank you so much, Juan. Um, that, was, that was a very uh, wonderful answer uh, to the question. Um, so now I'm going to ask a question to David uh, Duralongi. Uh, the question for you, David, is uh, can you tell us what your thoughts are on the role of traditional knowledge in restoration and with a particular focus on, on natural regeneration processes? Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for giving me the chat. Oh, David, you're a little frozen. Um, I'm going to make a suggestion um, that uh, we move on to the question with Renato and we will come back to David. Hopefully he'll be able to, to reconnect. So Renato, I hope you're standing by. Um, the question for you is how do we best address or assess, sorry, the, assess the potential for natural regeneration to enhance our large scale restoration efforts? Renato, are you there? We cannot hear you. Um, he is, his image is not there. Um, okay, can we, Yvonne, can we try to get uh, David back? Yeah, sure. And if, um, yeah, and Renato, are you there? Yes, Robbie. Hi, we're going to go straight to the question for you on uh, how to best assess the potential for natural regeneration to enhance large scale restoration efforts. Hopefully we'll come back to David after. Okay, so first of all, thank you, Robin, for the introduction. Thank you to the ATBC uh, for the invitation and everybody that is here. Uh, I could tell you that in the beginning, we didn't know about uh, if natural regeneration could occur or not in a specific area. And uh, the problem with this is that we are missing a big opportunity because if you will wait to see if the land will uh, have forest regrowth and it not happens, we are missing some money and opportunities. If it occurs, that is good, but there is a high uncertainty in this answer. So what we have been doing is try to develop predictive models as uh, Pedro mentioned, mentioned really well. In the beginning, these models was ba were based on uh, research knowledge. So the researchers were using their knowledge to say if a specific area could or not uh, have forest regeneration. However, 
there is a high uncertainty in this answer yet. So new models have been using historical data to develop and validate predictive models. For example, in Brazil, we have a wonderful database to do it that is called Map Biomas. Map Biomas is an initiative that maps land use and cover in Brazil from 1985 to uh, 2020, every year for all biomes in intermittent resolution. So we can uh, define specific windows and access where natural regeneration occurred in the past in this kind of database. The next step is that we need to remove what is forestry, what was forestry, and what was active regeneration, restoration. And sometimes we have database to do this. In the Atlantic Forest, for example, we have information for it. So as you clean it, for example, in the Atlantic Forest, we could see that over the last 20 years, we had 2.7 million hectares of natural regeneration in the Atlantic Forest. This is a lot. And based on environmental and social economic variables that you know that may affect natural regeneration, you can use this to develop predictive models over the next years. These databases uh, can be used in, in the Atlantic Forest case, for example, we used the last 20 years and we predicted this for the next 20 years. So we expect that by 2035, we can have more than 20 million hectares with potential for natural regeneration in the Atlantic Forest. This means more than 50% of probability of natural regeneration. So we should consider indeed assisted natural regeneration. We can have some assistance to this process and help this to scale up forest restoration. 20 million hectares, for example, is much higher than the Brazilian target for forest restoration. So this is huge. And what we have been doing is to validate this model as we have been doing using, uh, for example, species distribution modeling. We use part of the data to develop the model and the other part to validate the model. And this is critical. In our case, for example, we had more than 8% of accuracy to understand the potential for natural regeneration. The, the, what you can do with this? We have maps as Pedro presented, intermittent resolution for the entire Atlantic forest, the areas that could uh, have forest restoration, and we know a probability of the chance of natural regeneration. This will inform and guide your decision to understand if you can just leave the land, if you need assisted natural regeneration, or if you need active restoration. And when you compare models based on the potential for natural regeneration against models, with active restoration only, you can see that cost can drastically reduce, as Pedro highlighted. In our results, for example, we had more than 7% of reduction in restoration costs in any scenario that we developed. In the maximum potential scenario, it means more than $90 billion of reduction in terms of cost. Which are the next steps for this? The, the Pedro's presentation was really great. So the next step is start to validate this, putting together planning and monitoring. 
this is the next step for restoration. We need to have these two things together. You need to use remote sensing data to validate your predictive model, and it will help to you to have better and better models and better and better decisions. The other point is really related to persistence. You need to understand why landowners are cutting the secondary forest. If the secondary forest was not cut in Brazil, in the Atlantic forest, for example, we could have much, much more expression of natural regeneration in the Atlantic forest than the 2.7 million hectares that we had over the last 20 years. So it's very important to understand why landowners are cutting or not natural regeneration and what can make them to change their minds. Finally, as we can see in our pandemic times nowadays, uh, I told you that we developed models based on environmental and socioeconomic factors. To be honest, if you want to include or not environmental and socioeconomic aspects, depends on your point of view, or let me say, depends on the decision that you want. If you just want to understand the system as it is, you should consider both. But if you want to influence the socioeconomic factors where, which you can change then, your model can be based on ecological factors, environmental factors only, because you can identify areas that has environmental, ecological, biophysical potential. And in these areas, you need to change the mind, to change policy, to change the socioeconomic factors and make natural regeneration occur and persist. So this is how I see our way to uh, scale up forest restoration. We have been doing this as well using global databases for tropical and subtropical regions, and the results are also impressive. For example, we have around 238 million hectares with potential for natural regeneration in tropical and subtropical areas if the same environmental and socioeconomic conditions persist over the next 20 years. This is almost the bone challenge for tropical and subtropical regions. Thank you. Well, thank you, Renato. Um, very exciting information. And um, we really are getting better at assessing this potential. And I'm sure that things will improve as well in the future. So um, we are now going to move to Daniele. And then uh, David is back with us. So, so we will ask his question after uh, we talk with Daniele. So the question for Daniele is, what do you see as really a practitioner on the ground um, what are the key challenges to promoting forest restoration in what may be seen as an unstable or conflictive social and political environment? Hello, Robin. Thanks for the invitation. It's an honor for me to be here with you all today. Well, restoration is or should be part of a broader conservation strategy. In the Amazon region of Brazil, where I live and work, we are losing biodiversity and reference ecosystems before we get to know them. Also, the deforestation process, which is mainly illegal, comes together with very high levels of violence and very low levels of local welfare. Restoration is also about intention, and this intention requires the legal destination of the land, its protection, and monitoring. 
the lack of intention or worst, the counter forces against conservation and restoration in the Amazon, including illegal activities, are stimulated by national and international markets, unfortunately yet, and governments, federal and regional. So this is the greater challenge we have in the Amazon. There are many organizations, public agencies, communities, and landowners that intend to conserve and restore. And there are also great projects going on, but risks are very high as there is almost no enforcement of the existing law. It is not our role to do this enforcement. Risks include the, the permanence of restoration areas, but also threats against indigenous people, traditional communities, and ecologists. Brazil is one of the leaders in the killing of environmental and human rights activists. In the context is not easy in the Amazon, but hope prevails. And as implementers, <clears throat> We must identify the safer areas and the local actors that have the intention to restore and find the right incentives to support them and minimize risks. To conserve and spread this hope is also a challenge sometimes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniele, uh, for all you're doing and um, for sort of providing that that picture for us. Um, we'll we'll be coming back to some of those issues, I'm sure, um, in the the uh, breakout groups and in some of the other questions. And now I'm happy to say, um, David um, Duderlingi is back with us, and um, he is now going to address the the final question for our panelists for this this session this this section. Um, which is, uh, what do you see as the main role of traditional knowledge in, in restoration? Okay, many thanks. Um, it's a pleasure to speak about tech and its usefulness in restoration ecology. Um, it it's, has been a topic that uh, is being re it's receiving more attention last years and last decades. I'm glad to see um, forms of IPBES or Na United Nations having really tech as a, as a horizontal topic across all, all, all chapters. So it, it, it's getting lots of attention, but there's some kind of there's some pitfalls we have to avoid when, while studying tech and how to use it for restoration ecology. Um, first of all, some, some huge advantages to use tech in, in restoration ecology. First of all, it, it's a method, uh, it's a knowledge that is time validated per definition. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a knowledge of, uh, of it's a, a body of knowledge that has been constructed across many generations, across many uh, years of observation. So it's like an equivalent of long-term data we could have, uh, like Manuel Dupoy was, was speaking of, um, you really, if you if you draw uh, an equivalent to modern science, the data set would cover lots of years, and, and the result of it is, is traditional knowledge. So these data and information based upon long-term observation is very useful for for restoration ecology. Um, it's also it's based upon a supplementary method uh, um, compared to modern science. While modern science, science is very time bound and, and, and it's also limited by funds, available funds, uh, traditional knowledge uh, is not limited neither by time, neither by funding. Uh, its main objective is not generating knowledge, but to survive. So. Uh, traditional living people they don't they don't have any any other alternative than studying their their environment uh, and on that way they go growing their, their knowledge and, and their management so very interesting questions for restoration ecology like uh, species selection like which tree is the best tree for let's say uh, fertilizing soils 
Well, you can just go to local feasants and ask uh, for their agric agriculture plots. Where, where do they open a new agriculture plots? In many, in many cases, they will look for adult trees and they will look for some kind of adult trees that they know they, their, their little foal will um, <clears throat> recuperate uh, soil fertility. So, or we can go with the hunters. Uh, that's another example. Hunters will wait, they have their wading trees and the wading trees are typically trees that attract a lot of fauna because they are just in fructification because all are, because other, other, other um, elements. So they know very precisely which tree on which moment of the year attract which fauna. And this is very interesting information for restoration ecology. Also, if we go to agriculture, agriculture plots are very interesting for restoration ecology. On the moment when they start them, we can see which trees were there before them. And these are the trees that are basically uh, forming soils. But on the other, on the other hand, uh, when plots are entering in fallow periods, then we can go visit our plots and, and, and some pheasants will actually tolerate some trees from the last years of cultivation or actually um, broadcast seeds. And these trees are really good in unleashing succession. They have other environmental systems, uh, environmental services, um, like attracting fauna, like providing good uh, um, understory condition that will promote uh, forest recruitment. So th these kind of questions, uh, we can answer them very easily by uh, talking with local people and they're really hard to, to answer um, with modern um, scientific methods. So you don't have to see as competing sciences, but really as complementary sciences. And we can take advantage of that each science has their own way of, of, of constructing knowledge. Um, some of the pitfalls, some of the, of the disadvantages of, of uh, incorporating tech into tech or leg because it's not only traditional knowledge, it's also local knowledge. It's whatever knowledge of, of people living in an intimate relation when, with the natural environment and that are forced to construct bodies of knowledge across uh, generation does. So it can be mestizos, it can be indigenous people, whatever people that have a close relationship with their natural environment. So we, what are some of the, the pitfalls? Uh, beware of romanticism, don't copy whatever um, uh, uh, ever discourse of, of, of uh, feasants. Um, <clears throat> actually, most of, of those groups are changing their way of life very fast. They are inserted in a modern way of life with, with uh, growing needs of, of monetary incomings. So their traditional way of managing their, their agriculture plots of, of hunting are changing very fast. Um, natural medicines are replaced by modern pills. Um, fertilizing trees are replaced by uh, modern agrochemicals. So we have to do it fast. We have to document now um, traditional knowledge and management types. Uh, and we have to be aware of cultural erosion within these groups. It's very hard to measure, but one of the most used proxies are disappearance of indigenous languages. So these are these are uh, disappearing very fastly. In with those languages, also management and knowledge is being is disappearing very fastly. Another pitfall: it's it's actually hard to translate uh, local knowledge into broadly applicable tools for restoration ecology. Um, most of, of, of management techniques uh, is encrusted in a very detailed knowledge of their environment. Sometimes they have knowledge about reproductive ecology of weeds, uh, uh, about the time of fructification. And so this whole body of knowledge is very hard to translate to other groups. It's impossible to do that. We have to look for easy to, to copy um, elements like uh, which species is used, uh, when to do weeding and plantations. Uh, so we really have to, to look for these facets that is easy to extract from, from a local context because it's also encrusted in, in, in a cultural and a religious context. So this religious context is easy to copy into very broadly applicable restoration programs but we can extract some elements. So we have to, to watch out for those, for those elements. Um, and how can we incorporate those into modern science and modern restoration programs? 
to focus on, on list of plants, but we should focus on plants that also provide ecological services like for uh, soil fertilization, attraction of, of fauna. And most of actual publications still focus on list of useful plants. So we have to broaden up a little bit our vision. And also we have to engage with local people. Um, one of the best ways to do that is to contract local people as our research assistants. Uh, and also we don't have to see them only, we have to go a little bit further than see them as, as local hand labor. So we have to engage them in participating in actually designing restoration program. We have to invite them on the design, on the design table where, where restoration program are, are, are designed from scratch. They can uh, give lots of information on which species to use, when seeds are available, where are the seeds available. So we really have to invite them and, and construct those multi government panels where, 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 where lots of actors, lots of actors are, are involved. So um, tech is part of the solutions, has a lots of pitfalls, has uh, also lots of knowledge uh, we still have to build, but it's definitely a part of the solution. And also <clears throat> lots of programs are already contemplating them. Um, and I would invite to, for all ecologists, all the botanists, to really um, work with local people when we go to the field. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. And I think your, your uh, points really address um, a really important question uh, that we are about to, um, to ask uh, the entire set of panelists. Um, which is really getting at the question of how do we bridge this gap between uh, academic academia or scientific knowledge, um, you know, in the research realm, and the the practice of restoration, and particularly um, when that practice may not be as grounded um, in the needs of local communities as 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 it should be, and how do we then what uh, try to um, really uh, address this gap and, and bring some of this knowledge, uh, not only the knowledge from scientists, but also the knowledge from, from the uh, people who have been living in, in this region for a long time, uh, either indigenous or traditional knowledge, local knowledge too. Um, how do we then use that as the evidence base uh, to really power uh, the best possible types of restoration? And uh, to communicate this effectively to restoration practitioners who may, who may have a different agenda in mind, they may have different expectations, they may have a different timeline, um, and um, their their interests in restoration may maybe not aligned with with that kind of evidence base. Um, so how do we then create that that um, connection and uh, really share this information and make it? Um, it, essential for restoration practitioners to, to take up. Um, so please, uh, the four panelists, you're very welcome to, this question is addressed to all of you. So uh, please, please uh, just take two or three minutes in your answer. So unmute yourself and come to the stage. Okay, so um, I'm going to take a first step. Uh, thanks for the question. I think it's a real challenge, uh, especially because by our, the way with, that we have been, um, all of our studies and our career hasn't prepared us to um, carry out uh, this kind of communication with uh, local people uh, with even sometimes governmental agencies. And uh, it has, I think, taken us mostly by surprise, most of uh, researchers by surprise. And it has been, uh, has involved a long um, learning curve. So I think that the way, a way of overcoming it is um, by collaborating with people from different um, areas from the social areas, for example, um, anthropologists, sociologists, um, economists, 
people who are more used to dealing with um, social situations and social problems that are involved in restoration practice. Um, that is a way that I, I see forward also um, through students. I think that students provide a very natural and excellent liaison between um, researchers and research and, and practitioners, restoration practitioners. They can get more directly involved through their thesis and they can even become uh, afterwards some experts with a better training and more experience in dealing with uh, social issues, in dealing with local people. Uh, so I think that is a way to move forward beyond just sharing information or saying, okay, I have this information that can be useful without knowing whether it is going to be implemented. Uh, mm -hmm. So that would be my, my answer. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. And, you know, here, in addition to that, the question I asked to the, um, is, is simply involving uh, local people in the restoration a way to achieve this? That is, you know, by, by their direct participation and openness to their perspectives, is that a way to bring in uh, a lot of this knowledge? Or, or do we need something, um, you know, more institutionalized? Daniele, do you have some thoughts on this? <laughs> Thanks. Um, very good, uh, the words of our colleagues. And yes, we need to empower local people because uh, traditional people are conserving and managing the forest for thousands of years here in this region. And if we want to succeed, we need to learn with them how to do it. Of course, to get scale, we will also need to work with another stakeholders. And I am I was very happy that the opening session in the Restoration International Congress this year was about biocultural restoration because we really need to move forward. We are losing reference ecosystems as we are losing the traditional knowledge, environmental knowledge, and without respecting and learning from it accordingly. So I think it's a very important issue, especially here in Brazil and in the Amazon region. But we also need to work with other stakeholders to get the scale we need. But I would like also to ask this question in another direction that in my opinion, in the context we live here in the Amazon, the main gap that we must to bridge is between science, economics and politics. <laughs> we are here in the University of Maranhão where I collaborate, we have been studying and publishing all the environmental setbacks in the region and proposing alternatives for land use policies and development with forest restoration and other land uses. Even thought this information is public, including the general audience through the media. Science has no political influence here. Uh, one recent setback, just to give an example, here in the state where I live, the, it was uh, the approval of a law that uh, diminished the legal reserves and will result in the legalization of a new deforestation of 100,000 of hectares of secondary forests. In other states, uh, these setbacks are even greater. Uh, also here in the university with my colleagues, we do a lot of research on agroforestry systems and secondary succession. And also in the conservation international projects in Brazil, we showing this project and experiences that yes, it can work. We are supporting actors that want to restore and attract others as well as training local human capacities to work on restoration and conservation. Um, thank you.
Robin? Yes. Can I add something? So or adding or, or yes. highlighting something and very quickly, uh, I see three main points. And the first one affects uh, any, any stakeholder, any, any level of engagement that is to recognize natural regeneration or assisted natural regeneration as a way to do forest restoration. I think that this is the first point and we have been helping a lot with this. The second one is related uh, as Daniel said to uh, some laws and uh, some laws that are not good to help natural regeneration in secondary forest. So these need to change. And finally, uh, I always believe that there is an important aspect from the academy, the academia related to uh, policy makers. That is, we cannot only provide solutions that we believe that are important to them, but we also need to understand their points to help them with the best science that we can provide. Thank you. I, I, I would end up with- Thank you. I would end up with saying that we also have to acknowledge our limitations as scientists because we are trained to create knowledge. We are not trained to engage local people or to build up local movements. So, and, and for me, it's very important to ally with local agency, even government agency, as the NGOs also, because there's the know-how, there's all the experience to engage in, in, in local people to, to, to invite them to, to, uh, to work into restoration programs. So our, while our publications are focused on, on sharing knowledge with other, with peers, with other academics, you have to make additional publications to really share that invitation, uh, that knowledge with, with local people, to bring it in other languages and in indigenous languages. And I really think as academic sector, we will not do it alone because we are overcharged with work. Um, we are evaluated with other indicators. So I really think we should do more effort in aligning with, with, with local agencies. Thank you. Uh, um, I'd also like to invite Pedro to uh, respond to this same question. That is how, what are, um, how can we div uh, bridge um, the gap between academia um, and also between uh, tr the, the traditional knowledge on the ground um, and restoration practice? And that includes decision-making as well as implementation. Yeah, that, that's a critical question because, and, and also a major knowledge gap, because we have studied natural forest regrowth using a kind of more biodiversity conservation perspective, and sometimes using a, a livelihood approach. But now we want to promote natural regeneration in agropastoral lands, in private land holdings. So we need a different kind of knowledge. So we need to know how to, to profit from natural regeneration using PS, you know, carbon credits or agroforestry approaches or how to produce native timber in these contexts. So, but we don't have this knowledge uh, or at least this knowledge is, is insufficient. So if a farmer just asks you a simple question, like should I keep this natural regenerated forest in my land, let's say 10 hectares, you, you would say for sure. And the farmer could ask you again, give me reasons, but not ecological reasons. reasons. And you can tell the, the, the farmer, oh, it can improve your soil and improve the you know, microclimate and water. And then the farmer can ask you back, how much does I, I gain from it? You know, how much profit do I have? Because I earn a given amount of money with traditional land use. So we don't have the answer. So we don't have an alternative to use natural regeneration that could outcompete 
the you know the traditional agropastoral land use. We need to develop this kind of knowledge, and by doing so, we may lose some of the ecological functions, or at least they will not be maximized. We may have to prioritize some types of species and reduce the diversity of natural forests. I, I don't know, but we have to explore. We have to explore the, the intersection between natural regeneration and cattle ranching and agriculture and the traditional land use that have occupied these lands. But unfortunately, this is not the kind of answer that we have question that we have right answers or good answer to give. We just have suggestions of research lines and investigations to address. Yes, thank you. And I mean, um, very, very important issue there is, you know, initially we started on the research side to, to think about interdisciplinary teams and, you know, looking at the, the really broad um, and interest interdisciplinary questions about restoration. Um, but that still was with, with, within the academic silo. And then um, restoration on the ground started working with multi-sector coalitions, at least some, some of the um, implementation was, uh, was based on really convening multi-sectoral groups. And, um, but they, they really didn't involve the academics. So the, on both sides, there was broadening, but there still um, is a big chasm, I think, between even though there has been broadening of perspective and approach, um, you still have sort of the teams on the ground forming their own little world. And then you have, you still have academics forming their own little world. How do you see, uh, what, what opportunities are there for bringing these groups together? That's a little yeah. bit of a follow-up question. Yeah, I, I fully agree with you, Robin. I, it seems that, you know, integration is not a kind of thing we have practiced in, in, you know, in the restoration agenda. We lack integration across stakeholder groups, across disciplines, but that's the, you know, the only way to, to succeed in this agenda. So as an opportunity that I see, you know, just bringing some of my experience is that some of these, you know, implementers, NGOs, private companies, they they have some, you know, some experience in implementing plot scale, small scale restoration. But when they try to upscale it to hundreds of hectares, thousands of hectares, they don't know what to do. The solutions they developed in the past, they are no longer working for scaling restoration. The complexity is much higher. And then they are realizing that they need R&D, you know, they need research and development for promoting large scale restoration. And then they are looking for partnerships in the academia. And I have participated in some of these interactions and I see this is a, is a good opportunity because we can work together with these decision makers. We can bring more scientific evidence. We can, set, we can set up controlled experiments. We can use the restoration sites as natural or controlled experiments. And this, you know, this kind of feedback loop may improve restoration as a kind of emerge, emerging consequence of these interactions. So I think we need more interactions. The same way we have, we need interactions in purple forests among different types of animals and plants and so on. We need these at the restoration community. Thank you. Yes, I, I think in a way our, our discussions have raised more questions than answers, which is always good for this kind of event. Um, thank you to all of the panelists and also to Pedro for uh, participating and providing your thoughts on, on this very important topic. Now it is 20 minutes after the hour and we're going to um, allow everyone a chance to take a break. Um, if you can leave your computer on, please do. Um, we don't want to have people getting disconnected and then forgetting the time. Um, we will rejoin at uh, 30 minutes after the hour and uh, we will continue our event um, with the um, slideshow of case studies of restoration and assisted natural regeneration across Brazil. So have a nice break. Um, you know, we'd stop your video.
welcome back. I hope you all had a nice, a nice little break. Uh, now, uh, for our next um, segment, we are going to have a slideshow. And I'd like to introduce uh, Mariana Oliveira, who is going to be presenting. Uh, Mariana is a senior analyst at World Resources Institute um, in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and she works in the forests program there. She supports project management and programmatic contents related to forest landscape restoration, implementation, and strategies. Uh, Mariana has a Bachelor of Science degree in geography from Sao Paulo State University, an environmental management postgraduate course at the uh, University of Sao Paulo, and also certification on tropical forest landscapes, conservation, restoration, and sustainable use from the uh, LT program at Yale in the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. Uh, uh, I am working with, uh, uh, with uh, Mariana and others uh, at WRI Brazil on a project um, on catalyzing and implementing assisted natural regeneration in Mato Grosso and Pará. And as part of that project, uh, case studies were being collected for about assisted natural regeneration in uh, Brazil and other regions of the world. So I'd like to ask Mariana now to present her slideshow. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon for those who are in the same time zone that me. Uh, can you see my screen just confirming? Yes. OK, great. Yes. Thank you. So uh, as Robin said, uh, we, as WRI, started to work with more closely to assist the natural regenerator approach uh, in this past year, do a project approved, uh, supported by the NICFI uh, initiative. And we are working to support the implementation of assisted natural regeneration in Mato Grosso and Pará with support uh, from Amazon, Instituto Centro Vida, and also Suzano, who is a private company here in Brazil. Uh, I will not say too much details about the project and assisted natural regeneration because uh, I imagine that you already know this approach. And I will focus on bringing uh, the contest about the, the cases that we are compiling. We right now have more, uh, more than 30 cases in Brazil and ar around the world. Uh, but I will focus here today on six cases and uh, which are the characteristics characteristics of each of these ones. So the highlights here uh, is that cases vary in time scale uh, in implementation. So we have projects that were implemented in two years and has some monitoring uh, activities to be uh, con conducted over the, the next years. But also we have projects that has a 40 year project horizon. So they are already planning to do interventions for more than uh, for a long time. Also, these cases vary in special scale. So we have like cases with seven hectares, but also with 7,000 hectares. Uh, and uh, in terms of implementers and arrangements that we have, uh, we have private areas transformed into environmental reserves, but also we have these state uh, payment for environmental services program. Uh, as the panelists before me said, we have like very broader ways to work with these interventions. And I will try to highlight some of them here, okay? Uh, and I will try to, uh, to, to, for us to understand the cases that I will present, we brought some benefits uh, that are expected or are already in place in these projects. So it will vary from income generation, community involvement, combat climate change, efficient institution coordination, available financial resources, social benefits that these projects are uh, bringing to the communities, uh, if there is available of seeds and seedlings, uh, how how these projects are related to value chain for restoration products, uh, if there is like all of them are generating environmental benefits, some of them has this positive carbon balance being monitored, and also in some of them we have political commitment. So you're gonna see these icons in each of the, 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 the cases. In some of them I will uh, brought more details, but I will focus on each of like the most uh, different part of each of the cases, okay? 
Uh, and one more thing about the cases is that we have these uh, institutional arrangements. So we have Brazilian NGOs, non-Brazilian NGOs, governments, and like the private sector. Uh, and we have three different biomes in these cases. So we have Atlantic rainforest, Amazon, and Cerrado that are the central savannas in Brazil. Uh, as I mentioned before, I have six cases. They are distributed like uh, in Brazil. Uh, and I will talk more about them right now. The first one, uh, it's the project called Growing Hope. It's led by a local NGO here in Brazil that is part, for example, of the Atlantic Rainforest Pact. Uh, and it's, it was implemented with support from the community. So they had like a forest that was uh, being uh, degraded due to the extensive activities of uh, related to, to the, the products from the, the, the forest and also do with the cattle. So working with these families and uh, smallholder farmers, they put fences to like control the cattle, cattle grazing and also they uh, introduce seeds and seedlings from native species. Uh, so they were able to change the way that people were using that areas and all these interventions were made by the local communities. Uh, and the, this project was a financial, financed by uh, a, a project from the National uh, Development Bank in Brazil and it's being monitored since then. One important issue is, here is the connectivity with the community that support the development of the project approach, but also the connection with the value chain because all these, pro these products, for example, Herbamat and Pinhão, already have markets. And so th they were able to, uh, to connect the, uh, the, the actions that, were, that they were doing on the ground with was already happening on the landscape and with other uh, areas in the region that do the, that use the same products to, to commercialize. Okay. Uh, the second one, it's the Neblinas Park. It's a region, uh, this is the same photo that Pedro used in his presentation. Uh, it, it's near me here in Sao Paulo. Uh, it's led by Susano, it's the private company, but also with a, a private institute created to administrate this area. This area was privileged uh, a eucalyptus plantation. And what they did was to uh, allow the native uh, vegetation to come back. So they converted this area and uh, introduced a few activities like seedlings, uh, no, sorry, seeds to, uh, in, um, to bring more diversity to the area. And uh, an important issue here was that they focus on in, uh, specifically uh, native species, which, which we call Jussara, that was a native endangered palm tree here in Brazil. And uh, most of the time, people are very focused on this of the part, the palm of the tree. But in fact, the fruit is very uh, uh, similar to acai uh, that is. Uh, uh, from the Amazon, and they are doing like local initiatives with the community and groups of women to uh, process these fruits and to connect with market and develop these uh, economic activities with the local community too. Uh, the third case is in the Sesqui Serra Azul Park. It's in the central savannas in Brazil, um, Mato Grosso state, and in these case it's very uh, tricky that most of the time we are we are talking that one of the degradation factors are is the cattle and in this specific case they are experimental cattle to control invasive grasses and to improve the natural regeneration of native species so here they are not putting uh, removing the cattle from the area but they are improving the management of what they are doing with them to make sure that uh, we have these natural regeneration being, uh, being supported and being conducted with high quality. Uh, 
Uh, and also uh, this area is uh, being studied by a, um, an expert to make sure that all these monitoring indicators related to natural regeneration are being compiled to make sure that these R&R inter interventions are being uh, systematized. Uh, this case, there's another case, uh, it's a project called Forest Carbon Sink, also as Pedro mentioned in his uh, com comments about related to carbon, this one is trying to connect with this uh, carbon market that we are, we are talking right now, like it's hot topic. Uh, it's, uh, it's in an area in the Amazon and it's led by a combination of a private company, a local, uh, a Brazilian NGO and a non-Brazilian NGO. Uh, and it started in the end of the 90s. Uh, and it's focused on a farmer grazing area and they are building this carbon sink and at the same time trying to generate uh, these uh, benefits to community as they are managing the area to produce a uh, Brazilian uh, nut. Uh, so as I mentioned before, there are some, some of these cases that are very well connected with the value chain. Uh, and in, as we already have this market for Brazilian nut, these, these activities are easier to be uh, connected with other things that are happening on the landscape. And also these area works as a laboratory for forest and social arrangements. And, and they are very focused on, on systematizing information around climate change and biodiversity too. Uh, this one is in Pernambuco, it's the northeast of Brazil uh, and the project is Connectivity for Conservation developed by CEPA, it's a local NGO, also part of the Atlantic Rainforest Restoration Pact uh, and it was implemented in partnership with uh, a private company that uh, has to restore this area. It's uh, an area that was previously previous used by sugarcane plantation and they are building this ecological corridor. Uh, so in this case, they just put seeds and seedlings. They did not uh, they did not use fences, for example, because the degradation fact was not cattle, for example. So the price here was very low because the interventions were differently. And this photo, it seems very uh, dry, but in fact, there are like pictures in time that are get, are looking better than this right now, but we, we choose to bring this one to show how degraded the area was before and the, the, the need of intervention that was made. And uh, one important aspect here is that the involvement of uh, communities was mainly uh, in the production of the seedlings that were provided by these local nurseries, promoting this local market, generating income for the families that live around this area. Uh, this one is was led by Amazon. It's a local NGO that work in Para, uh, and it's focused on two farms, Asuacen and Rio Preto, and it started in 2010 uh, in one of the municipality that was the uh, had one of the highest deforestation rates in the Amazon. So the local government uh, look was looking for help. To, to, to change how things were happening on their municipalities. So they asked for help, they, they made this effort trying to, to implement actions to support landowners to comply with the forest code in Brazil. And these cattle ranchers uh, improved their restoration areas through this r, &R approach, removing the cattle from these regenerating areas using fences. So today, all of them are complying with the law. We are like Amazon is working to expand these areas for those that are not too, too they are not uh, too productivity uh, too productive uh, for cattle, and they are trying to expand these to other areas too. Uh, just final remarks uh, and trying to connect with all the, what was said before by the panelists. 
All these cases were implemented in areas that were previously extensive used for cattle ranching, monoculture of crops, or eucalyptus. Uh, most of the cases were implemented in private properties with involvement of the private sector. So we have to think about it when we are designing projects. And all of these studies ca study cases are providing inspiration, key messages, and lessons learned. As WRI, as Robin mentioned, we are compiling these uh, cases, trying to find some key success factors and gaps that need to be addressed that could inspire other people that are working on the ground. And we hope to, to be able to share more with you soon. And uh, as I said before, most of these interventions that were made uh, has the potential to support this large scale restoration movement as they were implemented with lower cost. We consider when compared with other restoration techniques easier to be implemented and uh, most of them considering uh, consider uh, the local needs and the local uh, knowledge to um, to do the interventions. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mariana. Really interesting to see how to make real all these initiatives in restoration. So, well, and thank you all. I hope you have enjoyed all the different activities. We're, we're coming to our, our last part of the, of the event where we want you to be more involved in the discussion and to, and to give some insights of different topics that we want to discuss. So following up on the, on the different questions that we asked to the panelists, we, we, we imagine four different rooms where we want you to, to choose one of the rooms, the one you want. And uh, we will have two moderators in, in each of the, of the, um, of the rooms. And, and we want you to, to enlist as a volunteer reporter. So, so think about it. We hope we, we, we will have enough volunteers in each, in each room, one per room. So in the first room, we would like to talk about how to improve communication and knowledge sharing between academia and restoration practitioners. In the second one, how can we use long-term data in seedling and tree dynamics to better inform restoration practices and its expectations? In the third one, what tools and technologies can help promote effective restoration planning, implementation, and monitoring? And in the last one, what social and economic factors favor natural regeneration as a restoration approach? So you will see up here a, a, a window in your in your uh, Zoom Zoom, and you can cho choose any of the rooms. The the titles would be shorter, so that's why. Uh, we put the slide again, and we will have 25 to 30 minutes to discuss about it. And then the volunteer reported, we will make a super short uh, report of what, what, what was discussed in the room. So I'm going to open the sessions. And uh, normally you will see uh, this appearing your screen. Let me know if it's working. You can choose the room, the, any, any room you want. Um, have a full vetting of the issues in such a short time, but I, um, I think I at this point I would really like to invite uh, one by one the uh, note takers to give us those of us who weren't able to hear your discussion some idea of the issues that were raised and the the um, the uh, topics that were discussed. So let us start with uh, group one on. Uh, communication and knowledge sharing, um, both from, you know, how do academics get their information out and in the right languages to the people who really want to learn, um, who are more on the practitioner side or even just landowners who are interested. Um, and what, I don't know what, uh, what other issues you talked about. So I think, who is uh, the person from that group? Rebecca? I think I think, I think that Rebecca? would be me. So, yeah. So, okay. thanks so much. Um, we had a really great discussion. Um, I'm just going to touch on some of the main points that came up. Um, one of the first things that uh, was brought up was that 
as academics, um, you end up publishing, but that is generally in an English language journal. Um, and it's becoming increasingly difficult to find other places to publish or find journals that will publish in other languages that might be more accessible to um, the communities that you hope will um, receive that information. So um, that, that is one important barrier. Um, we also discussed different ways of putting, making that information available, taking into account that um, many people on the ground, many landowners, uh, might not be able to engage, uh, you know, a long written document, or that might be their, the best way to provide that information. Um, digital information is great, um, but also may not be accessible by some groups. Um, so coming up with uh, easier ways um, for people to, to uh, I guess, see the, the findings of the studies, whether that's through infographics or, you know, um, kind of little booklets or something along those lines is helpful. Um, another thing that came up there is that rather than having academics, having scientists interact directly with um, local landowners, and we know that can be a challenge, there can be great time constraints. Another opportunity might be to engage with NGOs whose mission it is to, to reach out to those groups and carry out conservation or sustainability activities and do capacity building with them so that they can more easily translate science um, with the communities that they work with. Um, a really good point came up about actually co-creating restoration approaches with local groups um, and so um, really engaging in a, a co-production of knowledge um, and just going into some of the ethics surrounding how um, you, know, you, you select or you, do you carry out restoration research. Um, Miguel brought up a really good point about the effectiveness of long-term permanent programs that really engage with communities um, and develop relationships and that that is a particularly effective way to um, get information to people as well as to um, get information from uh, local communities on maybe traditional land management approaches. Um, we talked a little bit about larger scale communication strategies and um, let's see if I get this right. Science panel for the Amazon was brought up as a great example of um, providing clear reports to inform, inform policy and management. And um, then we kind of ended by talking about um, that it's really challenging for academics to do outreach because it's not really one of the metrics by which um, they're typically evaluated that oftentimes it's more impact factor in publications. So um, that's, that's going to continue to be a challenge. And if anyone else in the group would like to add something that I missed, um, please, please jump in. You did an amazing job. Thank you. That's pretty much what we've talked about. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Uh, that's wonderful. So now we're going to go to the second um, breakout group and they uh, asked how can we use long-term data in seedling and tree dynamics to better inform restoration practices and also the expectations of restoration? Um, so who who was the note taker mm -hmm. presenter for that? Oh, okay, Noemi, it's um, all yours. Yeah, first we were talking about the importance of um, long-term data. And um, we kind of um, stopped uh, a, a lot in that part because we are thinking that even though there is efforts and in collecting long-term data in a specific place, uh, we still believe that there is uh, uh, some gaps and there is not something like 4SG or that has all the information globally uh, for secondary forest. So at least uh, in our, uh, we didn't know of some effort that is, is coming along that line. So that was our first key point. Then the second part, we were thinking about what is missing our long-term data and you know, talking about um, you know, some variables that we, we should also measure, maybe students uh, be interested in environmental variables and play data in, in this um, long-term data. And then we came up with uh, come, sorry, the idea of uh, how biased long-term data sometimes is because we choose a specific areas and that we should solve that. Um, the fourth point that we have is that and talking about the, the connection of um, giving the information um, to the people, uh, we said that 
discuss about that. It's hard to give the information that you have because you write in the academic way to publish or to report, but it's not the information that someone um, will gather easily. So we still don't give a solution for that. I mean, I don't know if uh, personally, I think maybe it will be a separate and maybe the newspaper kind of like that's some of the examples like Robin has appeared in the newspaper and the people have understood some key ideas of things of projects that people is doing and um, then another thing is that um, uh, was come up upon is that the knowledge should always be shared in the horizontal way and not in the vertical way because it's important to communicate with people not telling them what to do but yes yeah, sharing the same level they have important information other thing is uh, about uh, using the information that the practitioner said. So we are talking a lot about the information that we can give uh, to uh, the people to use for uh, practitioner of uh, restoration, but they also have information that we could receive from them and um, use for better predictions and the models that and the panelists were talking that are necessary for uh, the real communication of these restoration plans. I think that's all that I have. Uh, uh, if someone in the group, if, if I forgot something, can jam in also. Thank you. Thanks. Um, anyone else from that group? There seems to be some common topics that were also shared with, with the first group, which is interesting. Um, so now let's go to the third group. What tools and technologies can help promote effective restoration planning? implementation and monitoring. Um, so who was the note taker for that group? Me, Roxana Arauco. <laughs> well, um, hello to everybody. So as you have heard, this was the discussion on tools and technologies and its role in planning, implementation and monitoring. So to illustrate this, Renato starts uh, highlighting four, um, four lines. And the first one, um, to illustrate combining that we should combine planning and monitoring by modeling to prevent waiting for several years to then know if the strategy will work. Certainly this will prevent um, costs, excessive costs and will save also human resources. The second um, item is that monitoring with drones actually implies powerful um, capabilities, including spectral capabilities, which uh, then allow improving the model by calibrating it and validating it. And uh, something else to take into account is that planning involves many aspects, um, meaning as well diverse benefits. And so decision makers will need to choose, and that is to find a balance between costs and benefits. And he or she, um, you know, we'll have to see not only one scenario, but several scenarios to, to then choose. Drones for implementation, we have all seen the presentation. Uh, drones are used as well for the process of seeding and, um, and they are increasing the, 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 the other uh, activities that they can do in the implementation process. But then uh, the other uh, aspect here is capacity building. Pedro highlighted uh, this role and indeed in several other areas, capacity building receives a lot of um, effort in terms of human resources and money, especially in, in technologies uh, like LIDAR or the interpretation of data. Again, because calibrating the data for this modeling is really crucial. And all this jumping, um, you know, it's very uh, important. Here is Noemi Wanka with all the data that she has collected in the field uh, directly. And I have all, many, many friends, uh, botanists, and you know, um, this old way to collect the data on the ground is good, but sometimes, but the data collected uh, with drones and this technology may be, may be um, available to the society faster. And so we'll invite some other researchers to actually analyze and, and produce um, more, more information. And so that was the contribution, including the society to have access to this big data, data set. And um, also because it means an opportunity to have a look to, the, to measure um, more rapidly and accurately amount of carbon sequestration, quantifying biodiversity. 
and also including uh, technologies like bioacoustics. So again, technology and tools for planning, implementation and monitoring in that integrated way. Then it was put onto the discussion and we didn't close it, but it was really important that uh, the question uh, going back to the decision makers and uh, the politics. And this was a case study from Colombia, you know, where uh, there are several projects uh, who are investing in drones to monitor areas or similar um, activities that, um, that Susana considered is a, a small scale when you may be concerned about like designing corridors or connectivity and um, and there is this trade-off about high resolution low resolution and what technology um, will be more useful or the decision maker at the at that level will be more willing to to use so the answers went around and you're invited as well to to jump in that it depends uh, precisely on the aim of the project, you know, um, Lanza images are really useful still. There are others that are high resolution, like three meters uh, resolution, but they cost money. And not necessarily depending on the project, you actually need uh, that high resolution. And then a, a Juan also with a case study on spectronomics, a, illustrated how both can feed each other, you know, um, studying parting out of from functional traits to then extrapolate it to a whole ecosystem. So I think it, it was clear that that is really relevant, it's really dynamic and there is still tons to do. And to my roommates, you are very welcome to jump in and compliment. Thanks. No, thank you, Roxana. You did a great job. It was a really interesting session. I think we could have stayed and discussed these topics for easily another hour. So, but uh, thanks a lot. It was great. All right. So, thank you so much. We're going to now um, listen to the note taker for group four. They talked about what social and economic factors favor natural regeneration as a restoration approach. Um, so let's hear from that note taker. Uh, we discussed uh, like the question about social and economic factors as Robin said. So I would say that the, the group uh, said uh, restoration, uh, passive restoration in general is more cheap than other type of of intervention, but at the same time, we need commitment that these areas will persist in time. So incentives are necessary to engage landowners and these rural communities. Um, as I presented in the cases and the group agreed uh, that some species that are already have uh, economic value or a market connection could be an important uh, aspect to be considering in this intervention in these projects. Also, ecotourism is an important connection that could be made and could be more uh, sustainable in time and could bring benefits to the to connect like these uh, communities and local people to these interventions in long term um, interventions. Uh, also, we highlighted that these strategies uh, can be connected with local culture in uh, for example, the, some species that has connection with some kind of religion or, or a specific um, ritual uh, from the, the, the local communities, and this can bring attention. Uh, for example, uh, uh, we, ha we also have some animals, some fauna species that could be uh, some highlight to these interventions and bring attention to support this in time. Also, we discussed a few about strategy that can allow management of these areas because most of the time we are trying just to protect or to conserve these areas without any intervention or type of management. Uh, but we need to consider this as factors to be addressed in the interventions that we are doing. Uh, it's important or could be uh, some factors to connect with other activities uh, from other priority agendas from stakeholders, for example, food production, so how we can introduce uh, some species that are important to, 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 food local, to feed 
these local communities uh, or uh, municipalities around this area, but also uh, important issues around water security, for example. And this, uh, with these, we connected also with, for example, payment for ecosystem services programs. That could be one way to, to bring these incentives uh, that could be technical assistance or financial resources to these local communities. Uh, we also discussed as a few examples of uh, interventions that bring uh, live fences. That could be one way to make things more cheap and also that uh, bring some economic benefit from these areas besides the, the, the natural regeneration of the area. Uh, and I said before, connected with the payment of system services, but also this arrangement for technical assistance that could favor uh, regeneration. Uh, legal aspects, so law enforcement and the need of compliance is a motivational factor for landowners, especially in Brazil. For example, here we have this environmental reserve quota system. Uh, it's a forest code two that is uh, a, an important factor that favors, uh, that could uh, favor regeneration and restoration. Uh, we mentioned also connection uh, of these areas in process of, of regeneration with market initiatives. So coming back to the uh, existing uh, market chains or product chains that already uh, exist, but also we could include carbon in this discussion too. Of course, that we still need to see the values of the that people are paying for carbon. But anyway, we need to follow this discussion because this will, we hope that this will happen soon uh, and we, we will have a better uh, better prices to, to support people. And this could favor a restoration. And one last piece that connected with other groups too, that uh, existing social capital, uh, cap, uh, capacity building education favors regeneration. And these are important uh, factors to be considered. That's it. Excellent. Wow, a lot of a lot of really good ideas there. Um, so let's see. Uh, we're going to wrap this up with a um, final session, which is just some an opportunity for Pedro and uh, for me uh, to give some remarks that pulls uh, a lot of this information and ideas together. Um, so, Pedro, I would. Um, Love to invite you to go first and take five minutes to to give us your your synthesis of what we've done today. Okay, Robin. It was really great to 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 hear the impressions of the groups, the ideas, the discussions, and to see so you know so much common point. So it's clear that I think one of the main challenges we have to advance this natural generation and large scale restoration is the integration of different research fields of different stakeholder groups of different mindsets so we are clearly living in, in a moment of change for for our planet and and for the restoration agenda so the solutions we thought would work in the past, they may not work now. We, we need different ways of promoting natural generation. And for me, I, I'm a kind of not so experienced in this field as, as many, you know, classic researchers, people that have dedicated their whole career to natural generation and forest restoration. But it seems that we have accumulated and enough body of knowledge to understand how natural regeneration proceeds, which are the, the key ecological factors and in which conditions more or less we, we can have nature working better to restore, to recover itself. It seems that we, now we have to start a kind of new research and practices, uh, practice agenda integrating different disciplines, integrating different stakeholders. It seems that the, final, the time has finally come to bring to practice all of the knowledge accumulated for natural regeneration. So finally, you know, big NGOs and, and private companies and governments, they are eager to implement restoration. 
through natural generation and they need solutions. But these solutions, they may involve the co-production of knowledge with local communities, with different stakeholders. And this co-production of knowledge involves different capacities, different, different types of training, different communication ways to, to promote this knowledge. So I, I think that, as I mentioned in, before, another group of things, the same way a tropical forest relies on interactions to persist and to function well, I think that the restoration agenda needs more this kind of connection. So we need connections, we need to integration, we need to reduce the, the barrier, the, you know, the differences between NGOs and research and private companies and governments and local communities, all of these groups must work together to find solutions that can really work in different social ecological contexts. And I think this is a major role for ATPC. And I'm glad to participate in, in, this, in this event today. I'm glad to see ATPC, you know, pushing this agenda and working as an active partner, as an active, you know, leader organization in promoting this debate and bringing to that together so many interesting people with different backgrounds and expertise from different parts of the world. So that's, you know, really, really helpful. And we need more this kind of interaction, not only virtually, but we have to, to go together to the field, to learn with each other, in different restoration approaches, to, you know, to learn how to dialogue with people that are different than I. So this is another critical issue, not only for restoration, but for society in general. We have lost our capacity, you know, to dialogue, to deal with differences. And that is critical when we, we dialogue with investors, with donors, with local communities. We need to be more flexible, more generalist, and more generous. I think that these are my, my final thoughts, my final issues for maybe stimulating a continue, continued de debate and discussion about this topic because we need this kind of common places to work together, to share ideas, and to dream together about a uh, future in, in which the neurotropical region will be healthier, with more forests, with a better use of existing forests, and with local people healthier, happier, and you know more satisfied with their tropical forests. So thank you, Robin. Thanks, Pedro. Oh. Excellent uh, set of ideas. Uh, I will just follow up with some of those and I have some additional ones. Um, first of all, I think when we talk about researchers versus practitioners, sometimes that line is very blurry and sometimes um, you need to sort of take on that other hat, that other role to really get the insight. So I know some of the people in this uh, group are also practitioners. Um, in, in one way or another. And they have uh, interacted a lot with the local communities and they really un have a much better understanding. It's only then that you really get an understanding of how do we move forward? We have to get to know the practitioners. We have to let them know who we are and trust what we do. Um, and we also need to get a better understanding of what they know and what they understand. Um, many practitioners know a lot more than we do about how to implement restoration locally. Um, so it's not that we need to teach them something, it's that they need to teach us what they know. So we, we should not enter into these relationships under the premise that we know more than they do. Um, and we need to be very humbled by the extensive local knowledge that people have, including farmers who have dealt with um, weeds and invasive uh, and, and trees resprouting and all kinds of, of issues over their lives as farmers, which are very relevant to, to restoring forests. And we need to really ask in a dialogue, what do they need? What do the farmers need? What do the NGOs need? What, what do they need in terms of information and knowledge that will help them do their job better? Um, so this is part of the co 
production that Pedro was talking about, the co-creation of new knowledge based on the needs that are identified by the people on the ground, not by a group of scientists sitting in a conference room deciding on what are the you know, hot topics for research. Um, sometimes those might coincide and there's a real, real opportunities there for huge progress on the science side that also is very relevant. And we need to focus, find those intersection points um, so that it's worthwhile for scientists to become engaged. Um, so the other um, thing I'd like to suggest is that we really need to expand the practitioner base, that ideally everybody can become a practitioner. Um, and farmers usually don't think of themselves as restoration practitioners, but if they are working to, to um, encourage natural regeneration on their land, they should be viewed as restoration practitioners and, and, and treated as such and respected as such and feel like they're joining this enterprise um, as active participants uh, and leaders in some cases. And that is why we need a better extension services. Also, we need to elevate the people who can share knowledge and help farmers, um, not only to grow seedlings and plant trees, but also to learn about pruning trees, to learn about weed control, to learn about when, if and when cattle can be used uh, or should be removed. All of these issues um, can be helped. We can get technical assistance to work with farmers and, and push them along and have, they won't feel alone in, in doing these things. And they will all be part of this whole practitioner movement. Um, and all, that part of that involves uh, really elevating the local knowledge and traditional knowledge um, to, to be used in implementation. Um, there's also, um, there were some suggestions in the, the first group about involving local NGOs. And I think this is hugely important that we have not uh, provided the right kind of um, sharing between scientists and NGOs and, and the, the farmers or communities they work with on the ground to really get equipped to move forward. And I have, I have had some experience with, with um, an NGO, Ecologic, who was doing this, working with local uh, NGOs, local community-based NGOs in Honduras and Guatemala. And uh, it's been very successful. And it's a, bit, it's a fantastic way for scientists to become engaged because often they have technical problems and they don't quite know how to solve them. Um, and it's just a, an example in how to translate not only the science uh, to the community, but the other way, translating the needs of the community back to the scientists who can then begin to uh, help develop or co-develop solutions. Um, I'd like to touch on the issue of incentives, which has come up a lot. And um, the traditional approach has been to pay landowners um, to, for their efforts in either protecting or conserving forests or restoring forests because their, their opportunity costs are very high and they have miss, they're missing out on income if they're not using their land for uh, commercial cultivation or, or cattle raising. So they need that income replaced. The, the logic has been let's replace that with PES. But there are not very many good examples of that working in the long term. That should only be an initial bridge. And there must be other ways of replacing that kind of support with internal uh, benefits that, that, their, uh, that their project engagement gives them. Um, so there, this needs to be, uh, I think, a very um, important issue to talk about how to make the restoration pay, as, as Pedro said, and many of you have, have said, making it direct economic benefits to the landowner through the value chain of their own regeneration or restoration effort so that they, it's part of their farm. It's part of what they do on their farm. It's part of their farming income is producing some products that have a high value that are, that are used by commercial markets and that, or other kinds of markets that can provide money or service in kind. Sometimes this is subsistence information or subsistence um, goods that are used to, 
family. Um, and there are some great examples of how um, these incentives can be applied and the perceptions of the farmers about the value that uh, restoration has had uh, for them um, in helping them to build their communities and helping to educate their children um, and in helping to uh, pro improve their livelihoods. And it's not just a matter of paying off farmers for their carbon or, or paying them so that they will comply. It's not about, ultimately, it shouldn't be about compliance. It should be about the motivation that people have. And that motivation comes from the needs that they feel. So it really, this is where communicating and understanding the needs of the farmers and landowners has to be front and center. And that also means expanding the value chains. So we don't get locked into thinking about just carbon as a commodity that we can buy um, and uh, sell on international markets, but other kinds of products that may have a premium value if they come from a regenerating forest and so medicinal products, for example, um, mushrooms that could be grown, uh, other kinds of products that people have been already getting, non-timber products, but also potentially some timber products that can be coming out of these forests, like the Jusada from the forests in uh, um, the Atlantic region, Atlantic forest region, that have a lot of commercial value, but also have cultural value for the people. So by producing these products, um, we're receiving a lot of benefits, not just money in their pocket, but they're also creating, um, using their indigenous knowledge and they're creating nutritious um, food and they're uh, amplifying and enhancing their culture and their, their connection with the community. So there can be ways of doing this that really can accomplish many goals and can accomplish them much in a way much more effectively than than tree planting approaches, which may have a more of a single-minded uh, benefit. So we can try to market you know, these multiple benefits that can come out of natural regeneration. And a lot of this comes down to figuring out where are the best places to do that? Where should those efforts go into the communities or regions or involving uh, NGOs, uh, where that is most likely to, to pay off in terms of um, the, the, a good capacity for natural regeneration. So here we can integrate that knowledge about um, how we can identify these areas and how we can map restoration capacity, regeneration capacity in order to channel and, and target our efforts very effectively um, because it is not gonna be effective everywhere. And you need the community engagement, you need the people involved that have a history in the region, that are interested, that have some traditional knowledge, you have the biophysical potential. When all of those coincide, those should be you know, the best projects to go for and, and then to use as examples for others. So I see that as how we can build this. Um, I have uh, and really, really enjoyed uh, the session and I'm so grateful to all of you for joining and, and the panelists for making their contributions and, um, I hope, I hope that you continue to become involved um, with the Neotropical chapter of ATBC as well as the broader organization. Does Zach and, or Natalia or Juan want to add anything? Sure. Or Patricia? Uh, I'm not sure what more we can add with that fantastic synthesis yeah. by both, both you and, and, and Pedro. Um, only to say thank you so much to both of you for moderating and, and helping to coordinate uh, this activity. Of course, thank you to the, the panelists as well, David, Daniele, Renato, and Juan Manuel, um, and Mariana as well for her slide presentation. And also thank you to um, the others in the Neotropical chapter, We've all worked on this as a team here to, to put this together. And then also um, behind the scenes, uh, Lucia and Emilio and Ivan also um, helping to coordinate this. Um, and then of course, to all the participants for sticking it out for three hours, um, quite, a, quite a session, but it just flew by as far as I was concerned. I mean, my only regret is I, I missed a lot of the detail here, um, but the good news is this is 
um, recorded and will be posted. So if you want to see particular sections again, you'll be able to. And for those who you know who wanted to join and couldn't, they'll be able to watch the session as well. Um, I'm not sure if any of the other Neotropical Chapter team want to say anything, but that's all I have to say. Thank you. Oh, thank you to all. I hope you enjoyed the, the session. It was really, I, I think I, I will need to see it again and take notes, but I think we can take out many, many elements that are very enlightening. So I hope that uh, happened to you too. And I hope you can join the Neotropical chapter anytime. <laughs> and I will add, thank you again to the words of all my colleagues, an invitation to join us in the ATBC 2022 meeting. Of course. That uh, if there are no surprises, will be held in Cartagena in Colombia in July of next year. So I hope that you will send many proposals for symposia and that we could continue some of these great discussions. Thank you. In life. <laughs> in BOA, life. In BOA and with a beer. And with a beer. <laughs> okay. Thank you all. I hope you enjoyed. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ciao. Thank you. We should do this as a symposium. <laughs> <laughs>